there, Alaskans, wherever you are. Welcome to the Must Read Alaska Show. Coming to you from somewhere in Alaska. This is the place where we talk about, you guessed it, Alaska. Where we keep the mainstream media on their toes and where we are standing up for what's right in a world run by leftists. You can find out more by heading over to mustreadalaska.com and also checking out the Must Read Alaska YouTube channel for some really great content. But first, let's get this party started. Okay. Well, welcome everybody to the Must Read Alaska show. I'm your host, John Quick, coming to you live from somewhere in Alaska. And folks, you are in for a treat. We got a double header today. I had Representative Gray on earlier talking to us about foster care and affordable housing and how that he is on a mission to fix every pothole in his district if it's the last thing he does. Very interesting guy. And I, I want to encourage folks to go back and listen to it. I think it's important to listen to both sides of the aisle. That's what I try to do here on the Must Read Alaska show. And we want to, I want to thank folks that listen, watch, or read Must Read Alaska. This last year, just through social media, we reached about 100 million people and about another 30 million people on the website and through Google. And so we do this because we exist for folks like you that are listening. And so we want to thank you for tuning in. And we want to thank the folks that help keep the lights on here at Must Read Alaska. But without further ado, I have a friend on today, somebody who is a living legend, whether she likes it or not. She has been a news anchor, a news host. She's she's dabbled in a little bit of everything. And she really, really, really loves preserving historical things in Alaska. Without further ado, welcome to the Must Read Alaska show, Doreen Lorenz. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Well, you have been a champion for all things historical um, in Alaska over the years. That has been one of the things that you have kept coming back to the table with, which I think is a good thing. I, I oftentimes find myself reading news articles about us tearing down historical buildings. Talk to me, talk to me about why that's so important for you. Well, I, I guess it's because my great grandparents instilled that in me. They were children of the Depression and they saved everything. Um, they had, you know, the, the gloves that you wash dishes with, mm -hmm. they would cut them into strips and use them for rubber bands. They were those people. And in Seward, you, you were lucky at the time. You'd have to band together with your neighbors and make grocery orders. And when they came in on the steamship, you know, everyone would share everything. And that was very much the sensibility. Uh, we didn't recycle things. We reused things. And you bought the best quality you could because it was going to last as long as you needed it to. And that was very much ingrained in me, I guess, in my DNA. And then I grew up with this magnificent coffee table full of people who were incredible storytellers. And just they didn't live big lives in terms of they were rich or famous, but they were incredibly wealthy with their great Alaskan adventures. And so that became for me a, a real thing of value and a value in preserving. So I am a fourth generation member of the Pioneers of Alaska. I currently belong to the Seward Igloo, which is my home igloo, as well as Juneau, where this year I am a president for the second year. So tell me when, when you see things like the Fourth Avenue Mall coming down, we were talking about this a little bit earlier. What does that do to your soul? I feel like people see that. And you get both spectrums. You get, oh, it's fine. You know, we need to develop. And then you get the people that are just like, oh, gosh, we're not, we don't have a second chance with that building. It's either once it's gone, it's gone. Once it's gone, it's gone. And, you know, we've had a lot of crimes against our, our society recently in the last few years, not just in terms of knocking down our heritage, but taking those quality materials and throwing them in the dump. Mm. And anybody says, yeah, we, we saved something and so it's okay. Really needs to go to a Green Build conference. They have them all over the country. They're pretty fabulous. Um, they talk about, you know, you got architects and engineers and designers talking about how to best build, sustainably build. And they will tell you every single time the best built building is the one that's already up. Those resources have already been expended and you need to preserve and take care of it so it can have an adaptive use to modern society and you know we we've turned into a throwaway culture and this is very much we're just you know oh tossing the heritage who cares yeah. there's people who care it's an important thing if you don't have that heritage then you've lost your roots and people without roots aren't well-grounded 
And you, we were talking a little bit about the difference between folks in Juneau and folks in Anchorage or any other place around the state. Talk to us a little bit about, you know, the people that don't live in Juneau don't get experience this. Do people in Juneau care about preserving things? And why do you think that is? I got to tell you, I moved to Juneau, I think it's four years ago now. I'm coming up on four years. I didn't really know that much about it when I moved there, but I have really appreciated the culture in that it doesn't matter your political views. It doesn't seem to matter how long you've been in Juneau. Juneau has figured out that preserving your heritage puts a cha-ching in the, in the box at the store. Uh, people who come for historic tourism stay longer. They spend more money. Um, communities that preserve their heritage have less crime. They, their people say they're happier. Their families are more likely to stay there and not move out. Juneau has joined a Main Street program that's a federal program by the National Park Service that gives all kinds of resources to help you preserve your heritage, preserve those buildings, and preserve the social fabric of and network of your community. And it seems odd to me that Juneau is the only city in the state of Alaska who's availed themselves of this program, which is readily available. Yeah, other, I love Juneau. Other cities should take advantage of that because it's probably federal dollars that come uh, into cities or unincorporated areas of Alaska. And, you know, there should be more folks than just Juneau taking advantage of that. So, you know, one of the things you and I were chatting about, I think yesterday, which you introduced me to a new word that I didn't know existed, <laughs> I'm still trying to figure it out. But it's, I will just say it's, it's a uh, bicentennial plus some years. And this is a really cool concept that you, that you shared with me about celebrating our country's 250th, I think, anniversary. Talk to me about that and why you think it's so important that we do this as uh, people that live in Alaska. So you weren't born yet, but <laughs> I distinctly riding my bicycle in the Bicentennial Parade in Seward. And all of, Ala all of Alaska, all of America was on this bicentennial kick. And it was just so much fun to celebrate the 200 year anniversary of us becoming a country. Well, we're coming up on our 250. It's in just a few years. And the magic word is semi-sesquitennial. It took me a month to be able to say that three times fast. Semi-sesquitennial, semi-sesquitennial, semi-sesquitennial. Do not ask me to spell it. <laughs> One of the things that I recall from the Bicentennial was on television, they had this thing called the Bicentennial Minute. And it was really a way to learn about the history and the context of how we can't our values as Americans. And they were some of them. Carol Burnett did one that was really corny. Gerald Ford did one that was incredibly boring. But they had a lot of them that were like, okay, this is a conflict that happened. This is a movement that happened. This is, you know, some part of our heritage. And this is what we gained from it. And by watching those bicentennial minutes every night in the news hour, frankly, is how I learned most of my American history. Nice. Um, so when I, I heard that, I, I came to the awareness that this was coming up. Apparently, folks in other states have been working on it for a decade. I Googled Alaska semi sesquicentennial and there were no hits. Yeah, so surprise, I don't know. surprise, right? <laughs> yeah, shocker. So I, I don't know if you know, it's an awareness issue and it's just that I haven't been aware and there's a bunch of people doing a ton of things or if it's just we're going to be caught flat footed. So as um, a member of the Pioneers of Alaska, I broached our group in Juneau and I'm, I'm going to actually tonight to the Anchorage meeting to talk to them about it. And I've already talked to Seward as some members as well. It seems like everybody's gung ho. So our intention is to do a semi-sesquitennial minute, and we want it to go on television, on radio, in print, social media, same message every day. And it's just one minute of pure, unadulterated, great Alaska adventure storytelling that really speaks to the character of Alaskans. And we don't want it to be, you know, news anchors sitting at the desk and here is our semi-sesquitennial minute. We want to have all kinds of faces and flavors and cultures of Alaska expressed. 
and really get those stories together to one, preserve them and share our great Alaskan experience. We want something that's really gonna uplift people and make you feel proud of our state. And it's what it has brought to the great American experience. We've been around 250 years. Most people stateside don't even know our stories. Well, a lot of us don't. Like, it would almost be like a living time vault. You know, mm -hmm. those things I remember when I was like in sixth grade, we buried this, you know, the time capsule, <laughs> time capsule thing. And this would be something that would be unburied for everybody to see whenever they would want. And I think that it's such a great concept. I think the thing that the, you know, you were looking around Googling and I think the reason why you never found anything is because you're probably the perfect person to spearhead this. I can't think of anybody that's better at storytelling and has the experience of news that, than you. And so I think I think it's very exciting for Alaska that that you could um, put some interest into this. And I think if you're behind it, it will happen. We were also talking about a specific story that you shared with me that I thought was just so, I mean, just this story alone, I had never heard of, I had no idea about. No, I mean, I would say most people probably have never heard of this story. And this is just one of 300 something stories that we could be telling on this thing. So tell, talk to me about this story. Tell me the story again, because everybody's going to love hearing it. Yeah. So this is a story. This is not factually checked as news. I did not live during this time period. So everything is secondhand. But this is the story that I heard. There was a gentleman by the name of Andrew Nerlin who lived in Fairbanks, but went to his home in Norway, which is where he was originally from, went back to Fairbanks and was very surprised to discover that he had been unanimously elected to be a member of the first territorial Senate in the state of Alaska, mostly because he hadn't run for that office. <laughs> so Andrew, you know, man of the people, definitely a public servant. He, his lifestyle was that he um, hung wallpaper for a living and sold wallpaper and figured out how to wallpaper log cabins. He's a smart guy. So he takes snowshoes and a dog sled and a horse-drawn sleigh down the frozen Taku River and ends up in Alaska's new capital in Juneau. And he quickly discovers, I think it took him a month to get there, and then he discovers that the governor is a Democrat and the entire house is a bunch of Democrats. <laughs> our entire territorial Senate was a bunch of Democrats, except for Andrew Nerling. It would have been really easy for the Democrats to marginalize this man. He was representing Fairbanks, but instead what they decided to do was make him Senate president. And the first two bills passed by the Alaska Territorial Legislature were giving women the right to vote seven years before the rest of the country and starting the University of Alaska system with the School of Mines in Fairbanks. Both of those bills were Andrew Nerland's. Wow. Talk about, uh, you know, a trailblazer before there was trailblazers. Yeah, and you know, his legacy is pretty amazing. I interviewed um, his son, his grandson, a few years ago. And he told me that Andrew had a son. I want to say his name is, I should have looked this up, starts with an L. And he was on the convention committee with the Constitution. So they had finally knocked out the wording and he brought it back to his family in, in Fairbanks. And Andrew was at the store. They had Nerland's home furnishings at the time. And he read the constitution and he said to his son, I want to say his name's Les, this is good. This is well done. And then he leaned back in his chair and died. Wow. Pretty amazing family, right? Yeah. And that's the kind of stories my guess is that you would hope to bring to this word I can't pronounce, but by any that Yeah, word. I was I was just talking with Shannon um, Crosley last night, who is our historian in Pioneers. And she's like, oh, yeah, we are so all over this. And she brought forth a really appropriate idea. 
And that is, um, she's like, you know, I'm, I'm doing some history on this house in Juneau. Shannon is a historic preservation architect. And I love her. She's like 30, red hair, gorgeous, tall, smart as a whip. And I love having her in Pioneers with me. And she she said that there was a guy in Juneau. Um, well, there was an awful time in Juneau where they decided that they didn't like Chinese people. Mm -hmm. So they went around town and forcibly removed all of the Chinese people. They just like picked them up off the street and you didn't even get to go home and pack and put them on a boat to ship them south. And there was this one guy who was a baker. He owned a bakery. He was Chinese. I want to say his name's Joe. And they were getting ready. The mob was getting ready to take this guy out. And the gold miners said, oh, heck no. No, 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 no. This man saved us. This man gave us credit through one of the most horrible winters we have ever had. And he gave us food. And without him, we would have died. So no, you are not carting this guy off. That's he awesome. has proved worth. And shockingly, the guy stayed in Juno his entire life, died in his 80s. So even though there was an acknowledgement or a, we were doing bad things. I mean, there's nothing cool about ripping people off the street and sending them south. That's just not okay. But even in that kind of feather, fervor, there were those who stood up and said, no, no, this guy, he's a cool guy and we like him. And even though he is Chinese, we're going to look past that yeah. because he's developed those that worth of an Alaskan where you help out your neighbors, even to your own detriment. So we're keeping him. I love it. That's Try the kind of stories. Yeah, there's a, you never we will never run out of stories. I don't think it's going to be difficult to get 365 of them. I do want to point out, though, that this is absolutely not the Doreen show. Yeah. Not any. Anyway, so if there's anyone who wants to help on this, I'm hoping that you'll put my email address down there. If there's a historian or just a good storyteller, or maybe you're a reporter or you work with a group or just, you know, Joe Schmuckatelli sitting at home, little time to do something. Um, we, anybody who wants to work, help us work on this, we definitely open arms. We're just getting organized. Don't feel that we're too far along. We're just getting started. <clears throat> Our thoughts are that we're going to um, probably take research that's already been done, come up with 365 stories, and write them out into one-minute formats, which is something that we probably need reporters to do because writing to time is kind of a tricky thing. And then get an appropriate person who's a good spokesperson for that story. You know, maybe it's not a politician. Maybe it's a 10-year-old boy who's a lutic, who talks about Benny Benson designing the flag. Yeah. And so we record the person. We have teleprompters and lighting, so make you look good. And then, um, you know, to cut in with a couple photos, slap on a nice intro and exit, and then that's our minute. Right. And then for the thing about social media and nowadays is that if it's a longer story, I mean, yeah, we have a minute for TV and radio, but I'm sure there's some things that could go on for 200 pages. And nowadays you can just click a PDF. And if people want to know the rest of the story, the Paul Harvey part, we can attach that as well. Well, I think that this is very exciting. I love that probably in other states they've had like commissioned committees that have $400,000 and they've been at it for 10 years. In Alaska, we're like, Hold my beer. We got this. We'll just do it ourselves. <laughs> we're, we're scrapping together. Yeah, we have. So you are aware we have zero funding. Kind um, <laughs> of raising money. This is just something we're going to put together and do. We're just doing it. If someone wants to give us money. We're happy to take it. Not me personally. We'll have to figure somebody else for that. I don't. I don't do the finance, and, and that's not my area of expertise. But if someone wants to be the finance person and figure that out. It would be really nice to be able to hire someone to do the editing and have that just be their job. Yeah. Well, I'm excited, Doreen. I think that this is gonna be a very positive thing for the state of Alaska. I think you're gonna find that lots of people, as you're already finding, are very excited about the idea. And uh, like I said, if there's somebody in Alaska that can help pull it off, it's you. So I wish you nothing but success. If somebody is listening to this podcast and has got, some amazing historical stories 
they have maybe some uh, finances they want to help out donate or maybe their time they want to donate or just ideas of who people Doreen and her crew could talk to. I'm going to put Doreen's email address in the description and feel free to email her. I'm sure she's uh, going to be looking for all the stories that she can get. But like you said, you could probably find 300 stories in about an hour if you really got after it. I mean, there's so many stories out there. I think you're not going to have a hard time finding stories. So anyways. Oh, oh. Alaskans are amazing people. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the pioneers of Alaska, we only have two missions. One is preserving the stories and names of our pioneers and the others taking care of Alaska to make sure their legacy isn't lost. I love it. Do you have any last minute things before we head out? Nope, that's it. Just have a great day. Thanks so much for letting us on. Awesome. Well, thanks everybody for tuning in. I'm John Quick. And until next time, uh, somewhere in Alaska. Thank you so much.